Michael, thank you so much for coming. We're going to talk a bit about the intersection of politics and children's literature. And I'd like, to, first of all, to ask you about Boy Giant, Son of Gulliver. What's the premise and what inspired you to write it? The inspiration in the first place was the illustrator, um, Michael Foreman, who 25 years ago said we have to do a version of Gulliver's Travels. And I knew what he meant by that, um, which was to do the story of Lilliput, which is what everyone knows, and uh, have him draw the pictures, and that's fine. Well, I read um, this wonderful classic, Jonathan Swift's, again, when he'd asked me to do that. I hadn't read it since university. And to be honest, I haven't read it since, because I came to the conclusion quite early on that this is um, really not a children's story. It's what, not what it was written for. It's been uh, adopted and adapted for that often. But I really didn't want to do just a text uh, for pictures. I wanted, in, in a way, to, to leave it alone. Jonathan Swift wrote it for a very good reason. He really didn't like the society he saw around him, and this was his way of um, talking about it in print. Then the world changed. Uh, and changed rapidly, particularly with the whole question of migration uh, that's been going on now for, I don't know, well, it's been going on forever, but in the last decade, it's been very much um, in the fore, to the fore. I was struck, like most people were, by the images of children being picked up dead from beaches in Greece or Syria or wherever, and the people struggling ashore, the people being drowned, and also the way in which we treated and thought about migrants in this country. And I thought, well, maybe I could use this story, tell this story again, set it now, but also set it then, mix the two up somehow. Because um, it seems to me to be important for us all, whether we're young or old, to learn to empathize with how it is to be lost in this world and have nowhere to go and be driven out of your home and to have suffered the horrors and traumas that many of these people have suffered and that we've lost sight of that. I, f I feel that um, we have to some degree forgotten how it is to be kind, how it is to be thoughtful. And since I think that's important and since you must write about what you think is important and what you care about, I thought, well, no, let's tell this story and tell it again have a go. It'll be difficult because you're, you're, you're crossing over strange territories from fantasy to not fantasy, or crossing from the fantasy of real geography to imagined geography. Fine, do it, try it. I love that. I love the idea of going, um, going somewhere which just hasn't been traveled before. I did it in Warhorse when I made a horse speak all the way through a book. And I quite like that. I quite like the idea of a challenge that takes me where I'd, I feel a bit uncomfortable. So that's why I wrote it. Have the satirical elements of Swift's original work been taken across by you in this recontextualization in a very serious topic? Yes, I think so. I mean, just to give you one example, um, there are many wonderful examples in his, in his, uh, in his book. But there is this um, wonderful notion which he introduces of peoples, different peoples, warring together for absurd reasons. Um, and in his book, uh, the reason that uh, the two kingdoms have a go at, at each other is that one lot of people think it's a really good idea to eat your boiled eggs from the sharp end, and the other one think it's really the most important thing in the world to eat it from the round end. And so they have a war about it. It sounds absurd, which it is, but we do fight wars for absurd reasons. And um, that seems to me to be the, and I use that in the book, that particular part of the story. So yeah, uh, it's, um, it's, it's satirical, but with me it's somewhat different. I'm, I'm trying to make some sort of um, story out of his story in a different time. Um, I don't use the same satire that he uses, but I suppose you could call mine comment. What value does explicit political allegory hold in children's literature? Well, it depends what you call children's literature. Again, let's just talk about one book. It's always best to talk about one. If you talk about Animal Farm, all right? Now, you, you can, George Orwell wrote that for reasons we know perfectly well. He didn't sit down and write it for little children. But you will find up and down this country that book is read by young people and it's read by older people. 
It's a book which can be read by both. And as you get older, what happens is that you begin to understand and tease out more and more what he was saying about the kind of world that he thought we were living in or about to live in. It's a warning book in so many ways, you know, which I think Gulliver's Travels is as well. Is it a children's book? Well, no, it isn't. It's just a wonderful piece of literature. And I th in a way, I never like to get into this business of whether something is a children's book or not a children's book. Because the minute you call something a children's book, it tends to be thought of as for being for very young children. The truth is that children grow up at different speeds. And you have, I mean, I have grandchildren that are already well into the Greek myths, and they're still in single figures, and others who don't read that sort of thing till they get to university. It, you know, we're all children. Some of us are more grown up more quickly, that's all. But with Boy Giant, you are trying to introduce or make aware to children the existence not of the to children to people i'm not writing this for including children. children including children the Absolutely. existence of yeah. the refugee crisis which Absolutely. unlike adults they may not be aware of yeah they'll be aware of it i think that's another thing one must remember that they are children are very savvy we think they're not listening we think they're not looking but if you think of a child today that child has access to all the news all the images that we have access to the notion that somehow they don't take it in, don't take it on board, are not sometimes traumatized by it, is, is clearly not right. Uh, how they deal with it seems to me to be very important. And one reason for having a book like this, which they might read, is for them to begin to understand um, that this is how it is for other children um, on this earth. And these are children who we have to take account of and not dismiss as being, quote, migrant. Uh, or asylum seeker. They're all these titles. No, 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 they're people. They're finally people. They're young people, and some of them just don't survive this. And when you think of the journeys they go through, this extraordinary journey they go through, which many of them do not survive and leaves many of them completely traumatized, and the way in which we treat them, it's important to talk about these things. We are a society which is deeply, deeply imperfect when it comes to reaching out towards people. I once went and stood outside a, what a, essentially was a, a barbed wire surrounded camp for um, migrants um, outside London. And this was a place where asylum seekers uh, were put. Some of them had been in this country for six, seven years, kids at school, and people came and took them from their flats, never said goodbye to their friends, just ended up in this place, which was effectively a prison. We imprisoned children in this country for being migrants, not crying to be a migrant and uh, treated them appallingly. Well, I'm glad to say that particular place has been closed down, but it still goes on. We still shut them up for far too long, and we still don't treat them with the dignity they deserve. That's important to say however you say it, straight or in a story, and I find the best way I can make my feelings felt, whether it's for stories for younger people or older people, is to tell a story, rather than to preach at people. I'd rather tell a story. And how much power and sway does that storytelling and the arts in general have over politics? Well, I hope a great deal, if not, we're all wasting our time, including this festival. I mean, what we're all doing here is exchanging ideas, tossing ideas around, finding out more about each other and the world about us. And we're telling our stories and we're singing our songs. If that doesn't make the world a better place, I'm not sure what does. Is the British canon too Anglo-centric? Um, <laughs> we are too Anglo-centric, that's for sure. Um, it's something that we, I thought we had, were learning not to be. I mean, I'm 76, so I grew up in a world that was an, almost entirely Anglo-centric as far as I was concerned. You know, the books that I read, what I heard, the way people talked, it, it, it was about us, it was all about us. And the rest of the world was other, the rest of the world was foreign. And bit by bit by bit, we traveled more. We met more people who were foreign, but they weren't foreign, they were called French, or they were called Dutch, or they were called Belgians. And then you learn about your own family, and you learn, in fact, that you have come either one generation back or two generations back from another country. And bit by bit, you learn that the, the center is not here. Um, and I thought with Europe, we learned that lesson, that we were, um, a significant country, an important country in, in Europe, but that we belong geographically, culturally, 
to this continent that was close to us uh, historically um, in so many ways. And so in that, the wonderful thing about that was that you could lose the Anglo-centric part of us and become European-centric and then, of course, world-centric. And that seems to me to have been wonderful progress. And I'll say no more except to say I hope we're not stepping back from it. What is your process for making sure that you represent other people's stories fairly? I've done a lot of uh, retelling, isn't it? It does, um, it does bother me before I start. Um, I just did a translation not long ago of The Little Prince, Saint-Exupéry. Uh, in a way, it was the easiest and the most difficult of representing a story because you were telling it as he wrote it, simply moving it into another language and doing the best you could to interpret the sound, the poetry, the spirit and all the rest of it, but keeping absolutely rigidly close to what it was. When I've done other retellings or fables or stories, whether it's Be a Wolf or it's King Arthur or whatever, um, the wonderful thing is with ancient stories is that you are really free to reinterpret it for the people today, for children of today. Um, that means you echo the language of the original, the poetry, if you possibly can, and have great respect for it. But it means you have also tell, got to tell it in a language which they can readily comprehend. I want children of 9, 10, 11 to be able to enjoy Beer Wolf. Um, and, and to know these stories of Aesop and all the rest of it. it. These are wonderful tales, and I use what talent I have as a, as a writer to try and um, tell them again, but in a, in a new way, in a different way, in a lively way, if you like. Um, so yeah, you've got a responsibility. You've got to be careful about it. Um, I hope I haven't gone over the line, so to speak, and taken over from... Um, and I think, I think with this particular story with Boy John, it was important just to acknowledge right at the beginning that this is someone else's story I've been using as the basis. But I've acknowledged what a wonderful tale it is. But that's okay. I think we can use other people's tale, providing we're doing it with respect. What stories would you like to tell in the future? <laughs> um, well, it's really hard because I've just started on a story right now, which is the future in the sense that I haven't finished it, so I can talk about that. Um, I've just started on a retelling um, of probably my favorite story in the world, but it's suddenly become unbelievably relevant. And it's called The Man Who Planted Trees by Jean Giono, um, which as you may well know is a, is a very, very succinct short story which feels as if it's not a story at all. It's written almost as a documentary, which it isn't, it's a story. Um, and I, I thought, and other people have thought, publishers, what a good idea it might be to tell that story now with young people particularly being as involved as they are in the, the way we treat our, our earth and how we can uh, restore it and renew it, which that story, of course, is, is wonderful about. Uh, tell it, but tell it with your own voice. Use, use the theme. Don't, don't divert and go off piste with it, but nonetheless tell it in a way which is not just a straight translation. So that's what I've done. I did it last year also with a wonderful book called The Snowman by Raymond Briggs, which originally was just a picture book. And they said, would you make a novella of it? Which I loved. I absolutely loved that. And in a way, I'm doing the same sort of thing with The Man Who Planted Trees. I'm, I'm teasing it out, um, not telling kids everything, but just telling it in a way which I hope will make them look again at the story and find it not just easily comprehensible. I don't want that. What I do want is them to be able to get to the root of what is going on in this story. Yes, it's important. It's a really, really important story about how each of us can plant a tree, um, in metaphorically speaking. We do not have to leave it to other people. We mustn't leave it to other people. That's what young people are telling us, and in fact, it's what we know is the case. It's science, it's David Attenborough, it's millions of children, and I think it's worth telling that story for them. 
Michael Morpurgo, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.